news has come out um, on two fronts. There's been a report uh, by the Washington Post that um, nations taken as a whole, reporting parties to the UNFCCC, are underreporting their annual greenhouse gas emissions by 23%. As an example, uh, apparently, the nation of Indonesia, an average tree, uh, absorbs 4.4% no, 4.4 times more carbon uh, than in neighboring Malaysia. So it's disparities like this that uh, the Washington Post has found with regard to the, uh, the reporting of emissions. A second important bit of news is that uh, this morning an addendum was published to the UN Emissions Gap Report. Um, it identified that all the announcements and pledges taken in together still leave us with over 50 billion tons of uh, greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2030. This puts us on a pathway uh, to approximately 2.8 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. And we all know that anything over where we are today is already going to be disastrous. That's right. So the, the world is heading absolutely in the wrong direction at a point where we have no time. We literally have no time. We are out of time. So the, the, the importance of this information is that many people are still talking about the global emissions per annum being around 33 billion tons a year. These figures are saying a much bigger figure, like 45 billion tons a year today. Yeah. And of course, many people are, are, are assuming that carbon dioxide is the key greenhouse gas. But methane levels have been rising so quickly over the last 20 years that now methane is a big contributor. Add in methane and the situation is looking much, much worse. I think these figures are critically useful to stress the importance of where we are today and then how we plan a manageable future for humanity going forward. That's, that's really what we have to do. This information tells us that the reporting system is flawed. Um, there's no single right. validated metric. Yeah. Um, we also know that there's no verification of the reporting system. Not only is the, you know, the pathway for reporting, but also the validity of the reporting is completely flawed. And so, you know, it completely raises the question of the, the pathways to net zero that have been defined by all the nations. Uh, what use are these if we can't rely on the fundamental underlying right. data? Right. So there's two points here. One is we need to normalize procedures yeah. so that everyone knows exactly what we're talking about and we're all talking about the same thing. The second thing is where countries at COP meetings like this one make commitments, we have to hold their feet to the fire. Right. So we have to have independent uh, analyses which are recognized officially as the analyses. And then we can follow year on year what every country is doing in response to their own commitments, let alone what is actually needed to create a manageable future. We also need transparency on the pledges. Yes. There's very little granularity in exactly what they're pledging. And I want to point out that my own governor from the state of Hawaii yesterday made a point of saying net zero is not enough. The state of Hawaii, in fact, has pledged net negative by 2045 yeah. and net zero by 2035. And if we can do it as a, the world's most isolated group of islands, uh, if we can pull it off without the benefit of neighboring grids and neighboring energy sources, certainly other nations can pull it off if they work together. Now, Chip, this is the strategy that we've got to discuss because they're saying the net zero target is really a poor target. We, we are cooked if we all go towards net zero by 2050. Yeah. We're already in a very difficult place, as we've seen from extreme weather events of the last three years during the polar summer in the Northern Hemisphere. What, what we therefore need is every country to follow Hawaii's example. Every country. And we're a long, long way from that. 
I believe we need to be removing 30 to 40 billion tons of greenhouse gases a year. And even then it would take us to the end of the century to get a manageable level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Right? So it, it sounds like a, an incredibly big challenge. But if we all pull together, not only can we manage this, it's the only way we can manage ourselves into the future. So the new IPCC report that came out in August of 2021 told us several new things, one of which is that melting of the cryosphere, Antarctica, the alpine glaciers of the world and Antarctica, is now essentially irreversible. Yeah. And thermal expansion of the ocean, which constitutes almost half of global sea level rise, is also essentially irreversible. We're looking at over a thousand years for these two processes. Sea level rise alone is something that we are going to be forced to adapt to, and the best we can hope for is to perhaps slow it down a bit. The need to pull carbon out of the atmosphere is the third column of dealing with climate change. We have mitigation, we have adaptation, and then we have sequestration. And this critical component is the least acted on and the most poorly thought through. How are we going to pull carbon out of the atmosphere? So the answer to that is how and also who? Who's going to be doing it? And I, I'm going to say the 197 nations of the world represented at the meeting here in Glasgow uh, will not agree on managing this problem going forward. I believe the proper way forward is through willing nations coming together I just give the example of Mission Innovation, which has 25 nations representing 80% of global GDP. If that grouping can accept the challenge to remove greenhouse gases at scale, but also to attempt to repair those parts of the climate system that are, for example, irreversibly melting, yeah. from, uh, particularly from the North Pole region. We need to re reverse that process. Can we actually create a situation where the Arctic Ocean is once again covered with ice through the three polar months of the year in the, in the North Pole region? The North Pole itself is now one of the warmest regions of the Northern Hemisphere during the polar summer. Now, we've just got to reverse that or else, as you say, sea level rise is just inevitable. And it's warming at three times the global rate of warming. Yes, yeah. So, two things here. What do you feel are our options for pulling carbon out of the atmosphere? And what are the techniques for refreezing the Arctic, as you put it? Okay, big leading question. <laughs> so, uh, we, we're trying to work on a whole range of different technologies. And Chip, you, I know, are looking at what we're doing and seeing how we can collaborate. Because we need all to pull together on this. And I, I think the oceans represent a major challenge and a major opportunity. And, and the, the way I believe we need to operate is to see that we, ch we challenge the problem of biodiversity alongside the pro problem of climate change. So one of our programs is on marine biomass regeneration. Can we return the oceans to the population of fish and mammals that existed three or four hundred years ago before we, humanity, started farming oil by taking whales for their blubber, which is really what we did around the oceans of the world? And can we reverse that process? We're at less than one percent of the whale population that we had before. And it turns out the whales are critical. They're bottom feeders, they come up to the surface to produce excrement, and, and that is the fertilization of the sea yeah. surface, which is in the sunlight and generates a nice green area of phytoplankton, food stuff for fish larvae, away goes the fish population. The whales were a critical part of the circular economy of the oceans, and we removed them. Can we pull the whale population back? Now that's one of our focuses, and I do believe that if we can manage this, we can also manage to remove possibly tens of billions of tons of greenhouse gas per year. Yeah. Now, I think the 
idea of keeping an ice layer over the Arctic Ocean through the uh, three months of the polar summer can be delivered if we can put white cloud cover over the Arctic Ocean for those three months. Now that sounds very challenging and very dramatic, but I believe there is a pathway to do it, and again using the natural processes of the ocean. When there's a storm at sea, we create tiny droplets of water, get carried up by updrafts, and they produce white clouds. So can we mimic that process and then surround the Arctic Circle with these machines in the ocean that are mimicking that process so we activate those where the wind is blowing towards the Arctic Ocean. Now if we could manage that, we keep the ice layer that is formed during the polar winter over the sea during that polar summer and then build it up year upon year. We're going to have to continue that if we start doing it for at least 40 years until we can get greenhouse gas levels down to a manageable point. We, we have lost something like 95% of the multi-year ice in the Ar Arctic. The ice that we see forming now is one to three years old. Right. It's at such a fragile status right now. Yeah. And it is Earth's refrigeration system. Mm. Refreezing the Arctic um, is an enticing idea. How do we handle the potential negative impacts that we aren't sure about? We have to always proceed carefully. Now, we don't have much time, so we also have to proceed as quickly as we can. Everything depends on how much funding we can raise to achieve this. But I, I think what, what we need to do, and we're planning to do this from the Faroe Islands, north of Scotland, uh, is to generate white cloud cover there and, and follow in detail whether there is any negative impact of creating these white clouds. I don't believe there will be, but we have to actually satisfy everyone and do very, very careful work on, on following the behavior of these white towers. Once we've, once we've got through that, and maybe this is going to take five years to get to that point, then we get into the business of building these ocean vessels, which I think we have a very clever design for, and we can start one vessel at a time. Once we've proven that with the vessels, then I'm talking about quite a period of time, 10 years before running this fully. Mm -hmm. And I wish that we could do it in six months, because that's the kind of timeline we really need to operate. Yeah, we are in a crisis situation. The house is on fire. We also have agriculture as an incredibly important tool on the table. Um, our global food system is broken. We have over 900 million people who are uh, not getting enough to eat, and we have over a billion people who are characterized as obese or near obese. And much of our food system uh, has been produced at the expense of the world's forests. Unfortunately, we can't just replant our way out of this problem because the majority of carbon in a forest is in the soil and simply planting trees uh, doesn't uh, quickly inject the carbon back into the soil. In fact, new studies have shown that within the first 20 years of a newly growing forest, it's actually a net source of greenhouse gases and not a sink. Um, but agriculture itself, how we treat soil, uh, I think is due for a revolution. Yeah, Rather agree. than flipping soil over so that the carbon meets the oxygen and we have CO2 and nitrous oxide and methane streaming out of our soils, we need to adopt what have long been known as uh, indigenous soil practices or regenerative agriculture, or in the United States known as simple soil conservation. Get away from plowing, use cover crops next to our uh, food crops, and if we can get the world's agriculture system uh, to embrace this new type of soil treatment, we could be simultaneously pulling carbon down at the same time that we're growing food from the same yeah, soil. Yeah, of course, there's another problem, fertilizers. We're taking nitrogen out of the air, which is fine, there's a lot of it there, to make ammonia, to make ammonium nitrates, to feed into the soil. And the runoff produces nitrogen oxides, which go into the oceans, and again, that's 
toxic in the ocean. That's right. So we, we have a whole series of farming challenges. The, I'm proud to say the British government did a series of really important experiments in Ethiopia and West Africa, right? where, where we, we got the permission of the local governments and farmers to divide farms up into strips of land. And one, every alternative strip, the entire agriculture process was regenerative in the sense that we, we brought in compost uh, to, to provide the fertile material. And it took about five to ten years to get these strips up to the same level of productivity as the strips where fertilizers were put in and chemicals. But en route to that, there was a wonderful little lesson in Ethiopia, just after the seeds had been planted in both the nature of strips, there was a drought. Those strips that had been treated with compost for more than five years produced 80% of the normal crop and the other strips zero. No kidding. And the reason is quite simple. Earthworms had returned to those strips. The other strips were devoid of earthworms, killed by the chemicals and so on. And so the earth was aerated. It also took up water right into the earth. Right. On the other strips, the water was just running off during the rainfall period. And so what, what we learned unexpectedly was a critically important lesson. If I take you to my part of the world, around Cambridge, East Anglia, very, very big farm area, very flat land, we're a bit like Holland here. And I doubt whether there are earthworms in that part of the country. It's entirely flattened off with fertilizers and chemicals. Now, in our gardens, we have earthworms and we know what an important function they perform. Imagine the low carbon level in those farmland soils. Now, of course, yeah. the United States is in the same position. So we, we need a, a revolution. It takes a long time and a lot of patience. Those experiments we performed in Africa were extremely expensive. We had to buy the compost in. Once you've got the farmland to where you want it to be, you're no longer plowing, you're drilling for seeds, etc. It becomes relatively easy because the, the leafy material from the crop is what makes the compost. And so it becomes a totally circular process. But you have to build up to it from, from the farmland that has been destroyed by these normal farming practices. In summary, allowing nature to do what nature does yeah. best, right? Um, restoring uh, the marine ecosystem, restoring soil to its appropriate level of health, uh, restoring the Arctic as Earth's refrigeration system. This is, this is what our chore is. And we need to bring, therefore, indigenous people into these discussions. Absolutely. You, know, you learn so much from the people who have learned how to live in a way that is regenerative. Yeah, yeah. Well said. Good. <laughs>